Welcome back, everybody, to the episode of the Jay Stevens Podcast. This is episode number 84, dedicated to a man who is a self-proclaimed lip sparring champ. And we see that on display five days a week when he busts skip up Mr. Shannon Sharp. And as always, thank you for listening and downloading to the episode of the podcast. On today's episode, we have Mr. Corey Thompson, co-host of the Scar to Great Podcast, coming on join me to talk about the Ohio State basketball and football programs. Corey, like I mentioned, is the co-host of his podcast. Him and his co-host Johnny do a phenomenal job talking about and covering Ohio State athletics in season, out of season, after a game, and even about recruiting. It does not matter. Corey and Johnny do a phenomenal job all year long. Even when things are not going, I mean, there's no games going on just like it is right now. Corey and Johnny don't turn it off. It's almost like they turn it up just a tad. Also, Corey mentions a guy by the name of Kyle Lamb during our conversation. Now, Kyle Lamb is the host of the Locked On Buckeyes podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. He is also the guy that runs the podcast network that Corey and Johnny are on. So when you hear Kyle Lamb, I didn't want you guys to wait till the very, very end of our conversation to figure out who this Kyle Lamb guy is. And you want, I didn't want you to hope that Jay would fill you in. I'll fill you in up front rather than fill you in at the end. So without further ado, let's go ahead and take a trip to Orlando, Florida, the Sunshine State, to enjoy my fun conversation with Mr. Corey Thompson, co-host of the Scarlet and Great Podcast. Hey, Corey, welcome to the podcast. Hey, how you doing, Jay? It's good to be on. Yeah, thanks, man. I'm glad you could join me. Um, I know your state was a little little late to the party, being Florida, with the stay-at-home orders that have been issued by different go- governors. Um, how has that stay-at-home order affected you and the people around you? Well, me personally, I'm still able to work because I'm in I'm in construction. But uh, the other, I'm in, the highways are just a ghost town right now, and you just don't see too many people out and about right now. So people are doing a good job abiding by the uh, re- requirements, but you know you could tell it's. Uh, most people, as, as I think it is around the country, like, a lot of people are becoming on edge now because it's just starting to get to carry on for quite a while. I think I think a lot of people are starting to get ready to get back to normal, but I don't know if they're going to be able to see it anytime soon. Yeah, I agree with you on that. It's it's kind of uh, shocking. I recently went downtown, downtown Indianapolis, and I was taking pictures of just the empty streets. I like photography and things like that. And it was just scary. It was odd to see, like you mentioned, the empty streets there here downtown Indy where normally it's hustle and bustle and there's stuff going on every single night. The bars are hopping. There's games going on, whatever it is. And all of a sudden I go down there and there's nothing. I mean, it is scary. And um, I'm sure, like you mentioned, like people seeing the empty streets, it I'm sure it is scary. And how was uh how was your family, my mom, dad? How is all the, how how are all they doing um, coping with this this odd time in our lives? You know, it, it's interesting. It, it my family usually is very uh, they just you know they have a thought that it's not as bad as what the government's making out to be. Unfortunately, but I mean they they still abide by the the rules. I mean there's six foot distance, or, you know stuff like that. But uh, I think. I, I actually think I think that's most of America, to be honest with you. It, unless you read Twitter, it's just they kind of feel like, okay, I know it's bad, I take it seriously, but, and that's kind of how my family is. Yeah, I, I respect it, I respect what it is, but you know, you know, we need to get back, we need to find some normalcy again. So, yeah, they're, but they're doing well. I mean, they're just you know, we're just all plugging along, doing the best we can. That's good. That's good. That's all we can do um, with uh, this uh, odd moment in our lives. Speaking of an odd moment in our lives, how the uh, how this kind of changed everyone's uh, perspective and it halted everyone's lives. Middle beginning to middle of March, it was the Big Ten tournament was coming around. Ohio State basketball was looking to kind of. Um, go back to the ways that they started the season as they started off uh they started off nine and no and then all of a sudden uh over the next 10 games they win three and seven how what what did your what were some of your observations with this current uh basketball season with Ohio State yeah it's interesting how the yin and yang of this season they started off strong you know went down in the middle and then started to finish strong you know they've won 10 of the last 13 and won some good games some key games in there as well uh it, it was interesting. It looked like just the chemistry had completely fallen off the cliff in the middle of the season with the team. They just really didn't know what their identity was. Johnny, uh, my co- podcasting partner, actually got a chance to talk to Chris Holtman because uh, Chris was actually uh, scouting a player in, at Johnny's high school where his wife works. Okay. And he got to talk to him, and he says Chris was pretty candid. He said, he said it's just a confidence issue. The young guys lost their confidence along the way. 
And it's just really hard for young players to get it back. Because remember, other than like Caleb and Andre, everybody was a sophomore or freshman. Uh, and Walker was in his first season with Ohio State. So it was just a matter of just building that team chemistry back and getting their confidence back. And you saw it come back. I mean, uh, you know, Kyle Lamb was saying it for, for weeks. There's still a good basketball team in here somewhere. The, the analytics are saying it. And, of course, lo and behold, they got their shot back. They started driving to the basket more. Their defense got more got more confident. Uh, they just got better and better as the season on. They turned it around against Northwestern, and that was kind of like the – to kickstart the, uh, the rest of the season off. And it's unfortunate because I thought they were kind of getting hot for tournament time, tournament time. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate. Um, not just Ohio State, but many other teams. They were starting to get their groove and turn things around at the right time. I think one of the bright spots of this basketball team this year um, was Caleb Wesson. I normally don't follow uh, I, I love Ohio State football. I don't normally follow their basketball team. Um, I did a little bit when Mike Conley and Greg Oden were there about 10, 13 years ago. But I, they lived in the same area, and they played against my rival school in high school. So I was kind of like, oh, I saw those guys dominate my high school. I'm going to follow them in college and watch them dominate everybody else. And so I was looking at the beginning of the season, and I saw that he transformed his body, Caleb Wesson that was, and then he that transformed into better play um, onto the court. Um, were you expecting that kind of play this year? Yeah, I mean, you got to expect him to get better and better, uh, and especially as the better shape he gets. And I think the only the only part that kind of weakened his game a little bit was he couldn't push people around as well down low anymore. But true, very true. But he was great on the uh, on the high edge. He was great at re- his rebounding. I don't know where became very lethal for uh, for Ohio State. Uh, he was getting there was games getting 10, 11, 12, 13 rebounds out of nowhere. He he didn't used to do that consistently. Uh, his scoring, you know, it didn't. It didn't uh, drop, but it got became different. He, and he was obviously one of the best three point threats in the Big Ten, even as a big guy. Uh, every time he shot the ball, I thought, you know, normally when a six foot ten guy shoots the ball from three land, I'm thinking, oh, geez, you know, that's not what we want. But uh, <laughs> with with Caleb, you're thinking, yep, go ahead, take the shot. We know you could make it. Uh, his low post game wasn't quite as strong this year, but it's a give and take. You know, he lost some of the body fat, body weight. And it, he's, but he's quicker because of it. He's more athletic because of it. He's better on defense. He was amazing on defense this year. A lot of people didn't give him credit for that. Um, he's he's gone now. It's unfortunate, but you know what? You knew you weren't going to keep him forever. It's and yeah, I hope I wish him the absolute best in his pro career, wherever that may be, NBA, Europe, whatever. I just wish him the absolute best going forward. Yeah, Corey, you know that 6'10 guys, they all want to shoot the deep ball now. They all want to shoot the three. And you kind of got to expect, like, yeah, it's kind of kind of how I am with Giannis. When Giannis shoots a three, I mean, it's like, why are you doing this? Oh, yeah, everybody your size does it. We kind of got to expect that kind of thing from those big guys nowadays. Yeah, like Dirk Nowitzki, Kevin Durant. You know, people forget that these guys were 7'6", you know, it's just yeah. because they could shoot from anywhere on the floor. Yeah, yeah, I remember when Kevin Garnett came into the NBA and he was shooting like 20, 21 foot jump shots and they were still twos. I'm like, first off, you you might want to get your feet a little bit further behind the line to at least you're behind it. But it's still, it's like he's shooting them and he's kind of consistent and he's confident. But it's kind of the trend of of where the uh, where the NBA and where basketball as a whole around the world is going. Um, what going into? Well, I know, I know it's early. I mean. Normally, basketball season just ended. Um, but if you were kind of predict what type of Buckeye basketball team there will be next year, what kind of team do you think there would be? Interestingly enough, I think we're going to see a more pure Holtman style team. I think when Caleb's there, he, he's not Holtman's not a guy who runs through a big not very often. But when when you got a guy like Caleb Weston, you do that. And it's not a not a knock on anything. The chemistry was fine. It worked. It, it worked well for three seasons. I know there was ups and downs, but he still won twenty plus games a year. And they looked primed to make a, a decent run in the tournament this year. But you know, unfortunate circumstances. Uh, and but I think next year they, they're you know who's going to be the big? It's going to be EJ, EJ Liddell and Kyle Young are probably going to start. You know, down low, and those guys are not traditional bigs by any stretch of the imagination. They're physical, they're strong, they have that, they're athletic, they are energetic on top of everything else, but they're not your traditional bigs. I think you're going to see uh, more run through more through the guards next year than run through the big man. It's going to be a little bit more of a different look, but it's going to be more of a true Holtman look going forward. And actually, I think it's going to be pretty exciting since you added uh, Seth Towns, who gets who gets to play immediately, and you get to bring in Justin Suing. Justice suing, sorry, uh, who was one of the best young players in the Pac-12 when he when he left. So I just, you know, the wings are going to be good next year. You got C.J. Walker. The only issue is 
I mean, you're going to bring Dwayne back to be the backup point guard after losing DJ Carton. You don't really have that depth at point guard that you would like to have. They just brought in a transfer from Utah State. Uh, he's kind of an Andrew Dakich type player, so he'll probably provide some decent minutes. But uh, that, that being said, Dwayne will probably be the primary backup point guard. At least that'll be the plan going in. And Dwayne's got to start anyway. He's got to start off the ball. He's got to be a scorer for the team. So, you know, you, you're going to have to find a nice rotation there. But I actually think the team could be pretty exciting next year with because of Towns and Suing. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So speaking, of, speaking of exciting, you provide great segues. Uh, speaking of exciting, there's a the other team in Ohio State, not just the basketball team that's that can be excited next year. The football team was very exciting last year. Unfortunately, it ended in a classic um, loss for us um, for the for the Ohio State for Ohio State that is uh, where Clemson beat Ohio State once again. But there's a lot to look forward to going into next season. There's there's Ryan Day, a, a guy that you can trust. You, he's shown that in tough times, he's not going to change who he is to beat to win and to beat the big teams and to beat the good teams and. My one question that I have going into the season, I don't know if you and Johnny have talked about this or not. How will Ohio State, help me out, Corey, fill the shoes of J.K. Dobbins? Gosh, man, I, you, <laughs> that's a good question because I don't think anybody expected J.K. He went from possible average, you know, Ohio State running back, you know, good player, not great, to, oh, my gosh, he's a Buckeye legend. <laughs> you know, so uh, how do you replace him? I don't think you do. I just think you'd do the best you can to, as Moneyball would call it, replace him in the aggregate. Uh, just Trace Sermon, uh, if Master, whenever Master T becomes healthy enough to play, and a little bit of Crowley when he's healthy enough to play, you're going to have to find that production between those three players. I think Sermon will get the bulk of it. He didn't transfer to Ohio State to to be a rotational guy. <laughs> so, uh, But, I mean, it, I, Sermon's a good player. I, I don't think he's JK, but he's a good player. So I, I think... What will happen next year, as you're going to see with Justin Fields' development, you might not rely on the run game quite as much. I think they're still going to have a powerful run game, but not quite to the point where, you know, J.K. is the guy, you know, and that's it. 90% of the carries go to that one guy, unless we're blowing somebody out by 70 points, which we did often last year. Very true, very true. Are you basically saying that before this last season, J.K. Dobbins was J.K. Dobbins was more on the uh, Daniel Boom Heron trajectory, and now he's up there with the running back greats of Ohio State? Yeah, I think he was like an Antonio Pittman, who's a really solid player. Not not, not nothing that the Buckeye fans really remember, but then he became in that Archie Eddie Zeke, you know, <laughs> category. Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 very. Very interesting, um, because I've always been a bit. I was always a big J.K. Dobbins fan, probably because he came in. It was kind of like he. We don't expect much from him when he came in. And I think he uh, took over for, for Mike Weber when Mike Weber got hurt. I think it was a few years ago. Um, so I think okay, yeah, this guy's he's going to be okay. He's good. He runs the ball well. He can catch the ball a little bit. And all of a sudden, like you said last year, it was just boom. It was bang, and not just the boom and bang of him last year out of the backfield and things like that. Also, Justin Fields. Justin Fields' last year production, it wasn't it wasn't expected for me. I don't know if it was expected from you or Johnny or any of anybody else you know that's around Ohio State. But when I was looking at Justin Fields, I didn't expect much from him at all because he's a Georgia quarterback, transferred over. Yeah, I know Jacob Eason left and played very played well over there on the West Coast, but I just wasn't sure about what to expect from Justin Fields. What did you think about how he played last year? He exceeded my expectations on every possible level. And I I didn't doubt him. I knew he could be good. I knew he was talented. But my goodness, I didn't expect top three quarterback in the country good uh, because it was his first year starting. It's it's a lot to ask of a guy, you know, in, in a new system, at a new place. It, and he only had been there from spring. He didn't get – I mean, everybody talked about Haskins here. Haskins was in that uh, offense for a couple of years before he had to play. And I love Haskins, but that's a major advantage. And Fields goes in there, and he, and he – uh, basically almost matched Haskins, uh, in a total production. So I, I have to say I was extremely impressed, but here's the most impressive thing in my opinion, Jay. He is unflappable. He is. In every situation he can deliver. It's incredible. Have you ever thought about making your own podcast? It seems like that's the end thing right now. Well, do I have the people for you? Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. Best of all, 
It's 100% free and extremely easy to use. And now, Anchor will match with great sponsors who want to advertise on your podcast. That means you can get paid for podcasting right away. To get started, go to anchor.fm slash start. Once again, that's anchor.fm slash start. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it goes back, and I, I read an article, uh, I think Bill Robinowitz wrote an article, do, wrote an article during the season, I think towards the midway or um, halfway point of the season, about an article about uh, Justin Fields, his issues with transferring to Ohio State, he got homesick, away from his parents, his dad, and mom for the very first time in his life, and so going from Georgia, being a Georgia boy, being at the University of Georgia in Athens for your ver- like for the beginning of your career, collegiate career, then all of a sudden you're going from Athens, beautiful weather, uh, all the time. Yeah, they get a little cold, but they don't really get the snow and the ice and things like that that happen up here in the Midwest and in Columbus to go from that to Columbus. And you're not just going to Columbus, say in June or July or even May. You're going to Columbus in January, and he got homesick. Then all of a sudden, in the article, Bill, Rob- Bill Robinowitz talks about how it was his upbringing that helped him. After his dad kind of talked him into staying, it was his upbringing and his dad being very, very strict, very, very stern. And Justin Fields kind of he developed a, like a almost like a stone face where you couldn't read him. His mom's his mom's and I think she's in a law. She's a, a lawyer, an attorney, so she's having to read people all the time. And even she could not read her son, um, just because he was he kept that. That that stone cold, almost like a poker look on his face, like, I know what I'm going to do. You don't know what I'm going to do. And in any type of adversity, he just stayed the same way. And that and, and Corey, that transferred right over into the football field every single game. Yeah, absolutely. I think to be honest with you, his most impressive game this past season to me, and maybe not numbers wise, maybe everybody would disagree with me, but the Big Ten title game, he was hurt. He was really hurt. He was not playing well that first half. But, man, the fact that he can come back the second half against a team with confidence, against a team that's about playing you, and just light it up the way he did just shows the kind of character and strength that he has. That he can let those mistakes roll off his back. Hey, it's a whole new ball game in the second half. Let's go get it done. And he got it done. He did. And I, was, I happened to be at that game. And in the first half... It was ugly, man. I mean, you you probably you watched it on TV. That game was that game was ugly, and it wasn't just Jonathan Taylor. As everyone thinks. Um, I think the wide receiver's name I forget his I forget his first name, but Cephas. Cephas, yes, number eighty seven was doing whatever he wanted to. And I'm at the game, and I'm, I'm I was texting Mandy. You 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 want you know her as well. I'm texting her like, where's Jeff Okuda? Where's Okuda at? I because in the in the in the stands we had no idea. But it wasn't just Okuda being out because I think he had a, a head injury or something that had him keep coming in and out of the game. But all of a sudden, Fields came in. Like you said, second half, it was a tale of two halves. The first half, Wisconsin dominated up front. And I, I, I know they were upset. They were mad because they had, they had to watch that film from the previous game when they played Ohio State in the middle of the season and Ohio State dominated. Yeah, the scoreboard, you may say, well, they didn't score 70 points. It doesn't matter. They dominated in the trenches. And those big those big linemen that, that Wisconsin normally has, they had to put up with talking not just that week from from the end of that very game in the middle of the season all the way up to the Big Ten Championship game. They had to put up with, you guys got beat. You guys got destroyed. You guys didn't put up a fight. And then lo and behold, Justin Fields, yeah, he had to get his line working and he had to get his team motivated, but he had to stay motivated. In that first half, a lot of guys first year starting that the biggest game of the year, they're going to fold. They're going to they're going to be flappable. Justin Fields is not that way. And it's kind of hot. It's kind of hard because how do you improve off of that? Like Corey, I'm, that's what I'm thinking in my head. Like, how does Justin Fields improve off of that type of performance last season? Yeah, it's a tough question. You just you, you, I'd have to be Ryan Day to answer that one. But <laughs> uh, the way I see it is, you know, he attacked the outside, uh, the oh, I'm sorry, the sideline quite a bit last year in the passing game. I felt like sometimes they might have been protecting him in the passing game just a little bit because he's still developing. Uh, I think this year, well, I mean, who knows all the reps being taken away because of the, the illness going around. But uh, I have no doubt that we have, we've seen the videos. We know he's working, but. Uh, you know, I think this year maybe they open up the passing playbook a little bit more for him because it allow him to have more of a field general sense. Uh, because he's he look, J.K.'s gone. He's the captain. You know, you know that uh, Tom Hanks film. I'm the captain now. That this is a uh, Justin Fields time now. You are the captain, sir. It's it's this is you're you're the field general. You get to see what's going on uh, throughout the entire field. Probably the coaches are going to take less uh, take some of the reins 
uh, um, away from him in the sense, not away from him, but you know what I'm saying. The coaches are not going to keep handcuffs on him a little bit. They're going to let him grow because he's been there now. He's, he's seen the big lights. You know, he's, he's answered the call. Now you get more of the playbook. I mean, even Ryan Day, I think, said that in a press conference recently. Hey, we, we got more of a, uh, we're going to open up the playbook more this year. Yeah. I think one thing that uh, you mentioned vaguely, very vaguely previously, I want to circle back to is how, all the spring ball and all the spring, um, uh, spring practices that we're missing right now, those are, that's huge. Because imagine Justin Fields last year. Let's say he didn't transfer in January. He transferred, let's say, oh, at the end of the second semester, the spring semester, and he starts in June. Well, that's a whole, what, three, four months, five months of football, of learning the playbook, learning your teammates, learning the chemistry, learning what your linemen like, learning how to motivate them. Because when you learn those things early on, those games in October, November, December, yeah, you remember, hey, yeah, we had that practice in February, and I had to kind of motivate you and push you, and I learned how to push your buttons to make sure you pancake the guy on the other side of you. I'm curious, what are your thoughts are about the loss of spring ball this year? It's tough. You know, it really, really, it's really tough. I mean, Ryan Day, think about this. He First time he gets a starting quarterback two years in a row, and he's like, yes, yeah, so the things we can – wait, there's a virus – we can't practice. Oh my goodness! <laughs> you know, uh, just just you know, just the worst time for him to, to be able to work with his quarterback. And now with a new quarterback coach, or anything, he probably wanted to pay a little bit more attention to what was going on. Not that he doesn't trust Corey Dennis. I'm actually very excited about uh, Coach Dennis, but uh, you know, still Ryan Day needs to kind of you know overlook it a little bit and say, okay, make sure he's they're doing exactly what I need them to be doing for Justin to progress the way we need him to. It's just got to be, you know, now there's a lot of uncertainty. But also think about, man, all the young guys that need those reps, that need that development, that need to study the playbook more, uh, especially like the guys who are early entries, uh, the two quarterbacks, C.J. Stroud and Jack Miller, or Paris Johnson even. You know, it's like these guys who we figure are the future of the program, I'm not saying they still can't be, obviously. There's still a lot of football to be played for them. But th- that first initial spring practice gets some of these guys on the field in the fall and uh, Urban Meyer was big on that. If you show up at, in the spring ball, you'll have a chance to play in the fall if you're a young guy. Now, h- how do you prove yourself is the question. Yeah, it's it's it, it's it's one of those situations that even as a as a coach you can't prepare for. I mean, you can't prepare for a virus coming around and a, there are viruses that come around all the time. So no coach is thinking there if something new is in the air it's going to cause us to not have practice. I mean, rain or shine no matter what it is if it's raining outside we can go inside we can find a way to get some football in us if we can't if if our practice area is a little bit is taken up on the inside oh we'll go ahead and watch film there's ways for football coaches especially college coaches to find ways to to soak up every second they can with these players and it's interesting. I know a lot of people, they're, they're critical of Dabo Sweeney for being optimistic or Mike Gundy for being optimistic. And if I'm a football coach, I'm kind of like them because I have to be optimistic. My, the players, they want to come back to campus to practice. The coaches, they want to get together and get into practice. I mean, it's, it's almost like when you're a football guy, it's like, it's like someone that's a coach that retires or that stops coaching for a little bit. Like Urban Meyer, for, for example. Urban Meyer got out of coaching at Florida. Due to health reasons. I, I think it was health, health reasons or family reasons. But he got a coaching at Florida. Well, went both, to ESPN. Really. Okay. I, I had a feeling it was both. Um, but then he went to ESPN. And then, lo and behold, Ohio State called. The job was open. And he took it. Well, people are like, wait. You said that you were leaving Florida due to personal reasons, family, and health reasons. But when you're a coach, it's what you do. It's in your blood. I mean, it wouldn't I wouldn't shock me if Urban came back to coach. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how his health is currently. But... It's only because he's a coach. So I don't normally knock a Dabo Sweeney for being optimistic or a Mike Gundy for being optimistic because they're coaches. Coaches like being around their players. And, Corey, I'm sure that if you were a coach, you may think the same way. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I And I'm not mad at Dabo for being optimistic. I actually I think it was a little silly. We storm the beaches at Normandy. It's, like, okay, well, <laughs> it's a little different, but um, no, but I, I do appreciate the positivity. Where Mike Gundy went wrong, and, I man, I really do like his positivity about it. And, but that being said, he also was basically he, the way he said it was, it made it sound like money was more important than the kid's health. And I was like, okay, Mike, slow your roll just a little bit, buddy. Uh, you, you're, you're getting, a, you're getting a little bit of crossing the line there, but uh, Dabo, uh, 
Uh, yeah, I agree with you. All these guys. I mean, Ryan Day's doing and saying all the right things, and I'm proud of my coach. But at the same time, you know he's in his office at home. Like, I just want a coach. Oh, this is brutal. You know, I just want to. I just want to correct C.J. Stroud's motion, or I want to work with the running back, or I, you know, I just want to work with my offense. I want to see how Coach Coombs and Madison gel together for the defense. I, and you know, there's a million things going through his head right now. But you know what? The great thing about Ryan Day is this. He always says when he has free time, he'll doodle up, he'll um, doodle, uh, doodle, doodle, as I can say the word, <laughs> uh, plays. You know, he'll just, you know, work on things. You know, Ryan Day doesn't stop. He's in his office right now coming up with different practice schedules. What's the most effective way? Researching the analytics, new plays. Uh, Ryan Day just doesn't stop. He's not sitting around eating candy uh, for Easter. He's, he's probably uh, scaring his family with how intense he is about uh, coming up with new ways to make the Ohio State football team even better. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's what you do. I mean, all these coaches, and I kind of expect it. I'm, I'm kind of uh, amazed that somebody hasn't gone down and talked to Nick Saban for an ex- a long period of time. You know, ESPN, they're, they're trying to find They're probably afraid of him right now. <laughs> he's saving in his house all day, not with his players. Yeah, he's, he, they're probably afraid, and maybe his wife's afraid of him for being home. And it's like, oh, you're like this all the time? Huh, yeah, get out the house. Go somewhere else. But you know how it is. ESPN, all they got to do is say, hey, Maria Taylor. Go, go interview, go interview Saban for a long period of time. We're going to put it on TV. Hey, let's go. I mean, it's, they'll do it. If you want her to do it, you want Fowler to do it. It doesn't matter. They're, it's what they, I mean, it's what they're going to want. And these coaches, I, I feel bad for them. I really do. Because like I said, you, you can't predict anything like this as well as like, it's weird that this is right in front of me. You couldn't predict how good the Ohio State defense played last year. And I'm pretty sure I don't have the numbers right in front of me. You may, but their defense was I want to say top five on, in the run. It um, was. It was top pat, five, yep. Top five run. I think I want to say top five in a pass as well. Is, is that correct? I don't have the numbers right in front of me. I know that their uh, – I think their pass defense was a little better than the run defense towards the end. Uh, but, yeah, they, they – uh, their top five total defense, period, anyway. The yards per play, they were one of the top uh, three or four in the country, I believe. And I know – I know – I want to say it was a month or two ago – Amir Reap and another player um, were dismissed from the program uh, for basically being idiots. That's all I'm going to call it. You're being idiots. You got caught. I'm glad you got caught. You're off the team. But there's other players that are gone. Chase Young, uh, Jeff Okuda. There's other holes that the defense has to fill. There's a guy named Sean Wade. And unfortunately, in that Clemson game, you and I don't like the call. Um, I th- I'm pretty sure the officials looking back, if they could change it, they may change the call. Um, that targeting call on Trevor Lawrence. But Sean Wade has, a, has big shoes. He has a big role right now. He's a leader in that secondary. Um, a lot of guys are going to be looking at him for his leadership, his guidance, and it's exciting that he is, that he did decide to come back. But what type of things are you expecting for the defense in the, in the fall? It's going to be interesting. I, I've been trying to talk to some of my friends who you know understand defenses a lot better than I do. And Gary Coombs is probably going to move away from that single high uh, safety a little bit and go more to uh, you know traditional two safety sets. It'll be interesting to see what they do with that third corner. I don't know what they're really trying to do with that. I, I think it'll be a little bit more of a traditional style defense than it was last year. But uh, I also think that's because of the depth at corner. You know, we don't have a lot of depth at corner, and especially now that you know uh, what happened with uh, Amir Reap and, and Jocelyn Wentz. It's it's like well. You know, they they got what they deserved, but at the same time, it does leave you, you know, uh, lacking for depth. I know that's not the most important part of it. I do agree with that for anybody screaming at me right now. Um, but that that so, you know, when you when you don't have the depth at corner, you got to make up for it in some somewhere. I do love the fact I was talking to Sean's dad a little bit, and I do love the fact that he said that one of the reasons Sean wanted to come back was because he wanted to take on a leadership role. I loved hearing that. And from what I understand, Sean's become more vocal. He's become more of a leader, getting the other guys coached up on how to play their positions. Sean's the one we just don't have to worry about. You know, he's going to do his job. Uh, the other corner, that's going to be interesting. But the good news is you hear about seven banks is starting to erupt, starting to look really good. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the safety position. Right now, you got to you got to believe it's Proctor and Hooker as the safeties right now. And i got to say uh, – I know Proctor's got great ability, but he didn't inspire a lot of confidence in that Clemson game. No. So it, it, it'll be interesting to see how much better he can get going forward, especially missing out on the spring, which is, you know, terrible timing. And honestly, you know, the thing I worry about the most, Jay, is I know you can't replace Chase Young. I know you can't. That's He's a, he's a monster. Okay. He's a one of a kind. 
uh, he's both a plus, you know. So I don't expect Zach Harrison to take that kind of leap right away. I think he'll eventually be a really good player, but he was so raw coming in. You just got to wait for You got to wait for his uh, development. I'm hoping in the aggregate of like Tyreek Smith, Zach Harrison, maybe Tyler Friday a little bit, John Cooper, you can replace Chase Young's production in there somewhere. You know, I'm not saying you're going to get it from one guy, but maybe Harrison makes that leap that, to where he's like halfway to Chase Young, things like that. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, I, I, that's what I worry about the most because I do believe Chase Young's disruption, even when he wasn't getting pressure because he's double or triple teamed, would takes up so much effort to stop him that it actually makes the entirety of the defense look even better than what it was last year. And I just, I, you know, you combine that Chase Young's presence on the D line with guys like Arnett, Wade, and Okuda. It weren't awful hard a team to pass on. Now you have unproven guys on the opposite side of side of Wade. You don't have Jordan Fuller back there to make the secondary calls, uh, you, and you don't have a guy like Chase Young who could take two steps before the offensive tackle even knows what's going on. So uh, that's going to be interesting. The pass rush can you can we get that pass rush back? Yeah, I, I'm I'm up in the air on, with that as well. I know normally um, what you would what I would think you may be able to do. Is kind of like with a running back, a running back by committee, but you can't do that with the defense. With the, with the with today's offense and, and how you don't know what's coming next, the RPOs are basically being called on every single down or multiple downs in a series. You can't just say, "Oh, we're going to put our run stopper in here now," because on first and ten, they may go they may go for fifty yards through the air. I mean, you just don't know what's going to happen. So the whole running back by committee transferring that to the defensive end. You that that my, honestly doesn't work anymore. I mean, there was a time where you could you could basically say, "Oh, I have my first, second down defensive end. I'm going to bring my pass rusher in on third down." You that if that was the case, if that was the way, if that was the way we could do things now, man, everybody would be doing it, and guys would be tired. Um, injuries would be a lot less um, than they currently are, and things like that. But the defense, to me, um. It's hard. It's very, very, very hard to duplicate what they did last year. The year after, I do expect some some type of a dip, but I'm not saying the dip is going to be us losing to Michigan or Ohio State losing a Big Ten championship. I'm not going that far because um, I do believe we still have the Ohio State still has superior talent to everyone else in the Big Ten, and that goes to to Ryan Day and his recruiting. Please help me. Um, I have a buddy who's a Miami Hurricanes fan. Went to high school with him. And during that quote unquote dead period, as we had recently, I don't know, I don't even know if we're still in the dead period, but he was like, How in the world is Ohio State getting all of these players in a dead period? And he's now, of course, he's hurting. Miami hasn't been anything in what, 20 years at least? And so he's like, Well, my team wants to do a lot. My team has a lot of talent down in Miami, uh, down, down there in Coral Gables. We can't get the guys in our own backyard. Ohio State's getting transferred from Oklahoma. How does Ryan Day get all these recruits to come in? Well, I think Ryan Day is considered one of the greatest offensive minds in college football right now. I'd actually put him above Lincoln Riley. Uh, I, I I think Lincoln's a great coach, but I also th- and a great offensive mind. But I also think he's a gimmick guy. Whereas I think Ryan Day and Kevin Wilson, by the way, for a guy who doesn't get enough credit, uh, design. You know, they don't do anything really that that tricky or you know gimmicky. They just run it down your throat. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, I actually prefer that style because you know what's coming. You just can't stop it. Um, anyway, that being said, uh, I just think Ryan Day has that reputation. How do you get C.J. Stroud instead of Georgia? I know Georgia's offense was pitiful last year, but still, it's Georgia. And how do you get C.J. Stroud to not want to go to Georgia when he has to come here and compete with Jack Miller? He has to come here and wait his turn. Uh, whereas he can go to Georgia. He may have competed for a starting job his first year. I don't think he would have, but he may have. They had nothing, and he's you know a top flight quarterback. So, you know, I think Ryan Day's reputation as an offensive mind, and he's young, he's energetic, he's got that. I Kyle Lamb and I were talking when Ryan Day got hired, and we both said this guy has the makeup for what the college athlete needs today. He's got that. He's going to recruit extremely well. I didn't know when it would happen. I didn't even think it would happen this soon, but I knew he'd be a great recruiter just because he's. I mean, once he was locking down Zach Harrison. Uh, once he's locking down Harry Miller and Garrett Wilson in that class, uh, you know, because Urban wasn't getting Zach Harrison. You know what kind of recruiter Urban is. Yes. So when Ryan Day sat down and did a did in home with uh, Harrison, of course, beating beating up on Michigan helped. 
But when he sat down with his family and got him, I said, you know what? This guy's for real. And people better watch out because once he gets a couple years under his belt, it's going to get scary. And it, it's it maybe a year sooner than what we expected. I mean, I was shocked he got C.J. Stroud in the end there. I The whole time, you, if anybody asked me, all my friends, people even people who quote unquote in the know were telling me, no, he, Ohio State has a legit shot. Like, no, he's going to Oregon or he's going to USC or – He's going to go somewhere else. He's not going to come here. For, we're no, nobody gets two quarterbacks anymore. And, uh, of course, lo and behold, he commits to Ohio State. Ryan Days is just a killer, man. Yeah, he he is definitely one of, one of a kind. And I easily, easily see why Urban Meyer decided to leave when he did. And he kind of helped appoint the next head coach when he did that way as well. Projecting the future, I know it's April. People are going to hate this. But quickly, what kind of uh, – what do you expect from Ohio State? Is it is it championship or bust, Big Ten or bust? Or do you expect a couple losses? What kind of season do you expect from the Buckeyes here in the fall? I think every year needs to be Big Ten or bust. I think they're that much more talented than the rest of the Big Ten. Uh, now, sometimes, like I think 2021, when that rolls around and Justin Fields is inevitably gone and we have Stroud or, or Miller as the quarterback, maybe even McCord. I don't know. I think McCord's going to actually surprise some people when he gets here. But um, I, I think then you can expect maybe – uh, it might not. Big Ten title is is still in, in sight, but it's going to be tough because you'll the youth you'll have. But that being said, uh, I think next year for sure it's got to be at the very least Big Ten or bust. And I do think they should compete in the playoffs for a national title. I agree with that. Um, it's so much talent. Um, coaches are great, and you mentioned Kevin Wilson earlier. He got a bad rap with. Indiana when he was a head coach there and me being here my mom went to IU and I'm like mom your school's horrible your school's trash and numerous times I'm like get Kevin Wilson out of there I know this isn't a football school but he can't win get him out of there but I realized that about a few months a few months ago there are certain coaches that are position coaches there are certain certain coaches that are coordinators in football there are some that can be head coaches not everybody is made to be a head coach not everyone is made to be an OC or a defensive coordinator then there are some that just need to be like a Tony Offer stay being a running backs coach or Larry Johnson stay being a, a D-line coach just stay where you are stay where you're good at and, and just work with it and, and Kelvin Wilson's one of those guys that with him with him with this offense I know you mentioned he may want to say something else about this as well but with him running that offense this man things are scary yeah, it's crazy, Jay, because I, I said on uh, Twitter earlier this year, uh, that, or maybe even in the end of last year, I don't know, I think it was right after the Clemson game, I said, I bet you anything with Gert Yersich being gone, because there was, I knew why, I, I always felt like Ryan Day took the play calling, not because, you know, he's confident in himself as a play caller, but he doesn't want to be the main play caller as a head coach. Uh, I always felt like he, when Yersich gone and the two, one of the egos gone out of that play calling room, he was going to start leaving the reins to Kevin Wilson a little bit. And, of course, you heard him in a press conference kind of not really say all that, but kind of hint towards it. He's like, I think we're going to have Kevin be more involved. And I thought, that's a good thing. I bet you anything, if he gives it to Kevin Wilson, that's a good thing. I had people argue with me. I don't like Kevin Wilson. I'm like, did you see that run game he just designed? Did you see that? Nobody could stop it. No top five rush defense in the country could even touch J.K. And that offensive line was killing people. And I know, look, Coach Studd has done a great job. But Kevin Wilson has his hand, fingerprints all over that offensive line. Yeah, yeah. I believe he wasn't, he, wasn't he with Bob Stoops at Oklahoma? Yes, he was. And he set some records for his offenses in Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we forget about it. And even like if I was going to go to an IU football game and mention how great of a coach Kevin Wilson is, they're like, what are you talking about? He was horrible here. He didn't do anything. He, he embarrassed us. We couldn't beat anybody. We lost to Purdue. I'm like, well, first off, all, IU is not a football school. So you got expect, expected to beat Purdue. Okay, yeah, great. It's good for the old oak and bucket and all that kind of stuff. But it, you can't expect every single year when you're not a football school where you're struggling to just get to a bowl game to beat your rival but yeah they may say it but you can look you can look at him he's an offensive guy and he's perfect for college he's not one of those guys I love guys like him that stay where they're good at because a lot of guys they want to take the leap and and go ahead and go to uh the NFL or the professional rinks Rick Pitino being one of them John Calipari being another one they take the leap go from college go to the NBA and then come right back to college because that's what they're good at. That's what they're what they're best at. And Kevin Wilson being another one, I believe he's best at that as well. Um, Corey, it's been fun. 
Before we close this thing out, I have nine quick questions I want to ask you to kind of get your first thought, uh, first quick thought that comes to your head when you hear what comes out of my mouth through the speakers, through your headphones, and then we'll close this thing up. At the end of this, I will allow you to uh, promote your show, let people know where they can listen to uh, you and Johnny, and then also where they connect with you on social media as well. Question number one, who was the better college football player, Joe Burrow or Chase Young? Gosh, good question. Uh, I'm going with Chase Young on that one. Uh, I, I think Chase Young is based on his ability. Joe Burrow has amazing ability, but I think if uh, uh, Bra- or what, what was his name, uh, the coach that went there, I can't remember the office coordinator's name. Or passing oh, Joe, Joe Brady. Joe Brady. Yeah, if Joe Brady doesn't go there, uh, then I don't think Burrow ever has an exceptional year. Favorite NBA player, current NBA player, and favorite of all time, LeBron James for both. Okay. Game I'm not. Wait, watched. but first, I want to. I want to caveat that I'm not saying he's the greatest of all time. I do think Jordan is the goat, but LeBron's my favorite. Okay, uh, a game you watched you'll never forget. 2002 Ohio State uh, national title game against Miami. Uh, I was young. I was hanging around a bunch of Miami fans, uh, along with Ohio State fans, and I truly did not expect to win that game. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody did. Uh, favorite vacation spot. Gosh, I'm in Florida, so <laughs> um, uh, you know what? I believe it or not, I've never taken a vacation in my life. So, oh, really? Yep, never. I've I've just been working forever. So. Oh, workaholic! I like it. I got okay. So this is the next one. Kind of goes right with that. Where would you like to go on vacation? Uh, you you, you know what? Uh, I'm a theme park guy. I I don't get out to. Uh, I'd like to go try some other theme parks because I got them all here in in Florida, but. I like to go out to California, some of the uh, maybe Disney out there. Okay, a job in sports you would love to have? I'd love to be a GM. I'd be terrible at it, but I'd love to be one. <laughs> kind of like a GM in Madden, doing your own uh, fan- franchise of fantasy yeah, mode. Some, I'll just simulate games and try to build a team. Yeah, <laughs> a game you would love to attend in any sport? Oh, you know what? If I could do the Final Four in March Madness, it'd be amazing. It would be. It would be. I think you already answered this next one prior to getting to it, but who would who would win in a game of one on one, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? Oh, you know what? I think they'd go back and forth. I think LeBron could beat him one on one. That doesn't make him the greatest of all time, in my opinion. But I think LeBron with size and speed and everything, I just think he could. Uh, that, but that being said, I mean, I, as far as the game of basketball, I'd go with Jordan as the goat. So. A Kobe Bryant, mem- a positive memory, something that you watch a Kobe you'll never forget. Oh man, I love Kobe. Oh, uh, you know what? I got one for you. Remember that time he stole the ball, or no? He got a he got an outlet pass. He was one on one, and that amazing highlight where he uh, takes the ball around his around his back, turns around, does a one eighty dunk right over the, the defender. Didn't even know what he was doing. Like what was what just happened? Uh, I I can't describe it very well, but that highlight. Well, I saw it live, and I thought I cannot believe a human being just did that. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Yes, yes. I was. I had a feeling you were going that route when you were talking. When as soon as you said a, around the back, I was like, yes, I remember that in my mind. I can actually visualize that exact sequence um, as you're as you're describing. He did it, it so effortlessly, like he's just done it a million times. <laughs> <laughs> One of a kind, man. I'm, I, 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 it sucks that he's gone, but we do have YouTube. ESPN is going to keep. Blasting all of his games right in front of us, NBA TV, and I'm appreciative of it because he's one of those talents that you'll never really get again. Um, nobody can ever try. I don't think we'll ever get a player that's going to try to duplicate Jordan because it's so very hard. Kobe did it, and Kobe did it better than anybody could have imagined. Um, he's, Corey, if it weren't for Michael Jordan, he'd be the best two guard of all time. <laughs> oh, easily. Oh yeah, easily, easily. Because y- you put him up against any other two guard, it's. It's it's cakewalk. He's destroying it's everybody. It's kind of scary. The gap, isn't it? Like Jordan, Kobe, then just <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think Kobe and I, and I, Kobe, Kobe Kobe Bryant mentioned it. He said he did not co- become the defender. Didn't mean to go on this rabbit trouble. It's good. I like it. Uh, Kobe oh, Bryant Kobe said all night. he didn't mean to. He didn't even expect to become the defender that he was, or he didn't get propelled to be the best defender that he was until that 0-1 finals with Allen Iverson because he realized this guy's six foot. Maybe, probably 5'9", five, 5'10", five, maybe 150, 155, 155 pounds, but he's fearless. He doesn't care who you are, how big you are. He's going in and challenging Shaq every time he gets in the paint and doesn't care who you are. Shaq's, what, 315, 320 at the time. Alan Iris is like, hey, man, I don't care if you're double my size. I'm still going to attack you every single time. 
And Kobe Bryant, like he, he he attested. He said, if it wasn't for Allen Iverson, I would not be the defender that I was because he challenged me in that way. And Corey, we'll probably never see anybody attack the defensive end like he did. You know, you, you know what? Speaking of Allen Iverson, real quick, I'll give the, I'll give him this. And people do not talk do not talk about him enough. I have never seen a guy who was the only guy on a team. Like literally, just I, you, you could barely name the rest of the. You Other can't LeBron, say that because you know that Cavs fans would say LeBron was the only guy on some of his teams too. Well, LeBron did one one year, 2007. I think I was starting shooting guard that year because it was <laughs> that bad. Uh, but, you know, I, I swear when they did the starting lineup, I'm like, who are, the heck is this team? But yeah. Uh, but anyway, I'll give it to AI, dude. I mean, anybody remembers those Fe- or, uh, Phoenix, uh, Sixers teams? I Matt Geiger, Al, Eric Snow. I mean, <laughs> it's like... The Cam Bayman is when he was like a hundred years old. Uh, it's it's like that AI just he beat the Lakers game one, and I thought, okay, this guy's a problem. He put up fifty. Yeah, he put he up fifty in game one. Could not be stopped. No, he couldn't. And it T- took him to overtime game two, I think. Yeah, I I think I think you're right. I think I think you're right with that. And after game two, after. I think it was game two, game three started. You kind of realize that the Lakers are just going to roll on and keep going on. Um, he with probably that got thing. tired. He was literally carrying that whole franchise. <laughs> Playing like 40-plus minutes a night. I think, I think he played 42, 43 minutes a night that season. I mean, for the entire season, including the playoffs and the finals and all well, that jazz. He was jazz. MVP that year, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. Back when they allowed the uh, back when they announced the, uh, the MVP in front of the home fans. I miss those days. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a lot about the NBA I missed from the 2000, early 2000s. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you mean prior to the Mouse of the Palace where the Pacers kind of changed how basketball was presented to everyone. Exactly, yeah. Thank, thank you, Ron Artest. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was actually watching that game, and I was in my basement watching high school football. The team of the area was dominating, and so I was watching that, flipped over to ESPN. And I'm like, hold on. Ron Artest is laying down on the scores table. Next thing, he's in the stands. Next thing, Jermaine O'Neal almost knocks a fan out. I'm like, what is this? This is not expected, but... That did change. That changed a lot. I thought it was funny when Artest hit the wrong guy. <laughs> hey, I mean, he, he he was basically blacked out walking around. He didn't know he didn't know where he was, what was going on. And it's just lucky that he was around people that actually knew him and wanted to take care of him and protect him. Because if not, it could have ended for him really badly. Yeah, it's just uh, yeah, that was a that was a huge story for gosh, like like a month. It just was on replay constantly on ESPN. <laughs> Yeah, Corey, you and I could go on forever. Um, we'll definitely have you on the show later on, definitely during football season, probably towards the midway. Let's um, pray there is a football season. I man, I hope so. I, I, I hope so. I would. I, oh my, you could imagine. You, you could. I, I couldn't even imagine like the thought of waking up on a Saturday, no matter if you work or not. Waking up on a Saturday and there being no football. Waking up on a Sunday and at one o'clock, CBS has. Some like random show rerun on. I couldn't imagine that. <laughs> Big Bang Theory, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, got to replay it as much as they can. Take some time if you could to um, promote your show, your podcast, a Scarlet a Great Podcast, um, with you and Johnny, where people can listen to you guys, and then where they connect, where they can connect with you on social media as well. Well, if you want to follow me, follow me on Twitter, I'm at Scarlet Great CT. Johnny's at Scarlet Great JL. Uh, we, if you ever want to find our show, the Unscripted Ohio Network is on all your favorite streaming services: Google, uh, Google Play, iTunes, uh, Stitch, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, all those good ones. Uh, also, Spotify. Just check us out there. That's the easiest way to find us. Yeah, Corey, I appreciate you coming on um, a little bit later on the on a Monday evening than probably expected. But hey, it's we're up. We're 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 still doing what we got to do. I'm working as well, just like you. So it's like, oh, I just got off work. Let me talk to Corey a little bit and uh, enjoy this time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I look forward to hopefully having a football season in the fall. Hey, man, man. Thanks for having me on. I love your show, bro. Did you enjoy that impromptu conversation at the end about early 2000s NBA basketball? Because I know I did, and I surely know Corey did. That was not planned. Here in my notes, I'm looking them over right now as I am talking. Nowhere on here does it say, Jay, take a left turn and talk about early 2000s NBA basketball. Or the, at the top of the page, it's all my notes that are talking about the Ohio State basketball and football programs that Corey and I talked about. 
after that, there's a big note at the middle of my page because I tend to forget things. So I had to make that note kind of big and then circle it. After that, it's the last nine questions or nine thoughts slash questions. Uh, give me your first thought. Something that pops in your head whenever you hear what comes out of my mouth. That's all those things. And I have check marks next to those to make sure I covered all of those. At the end, I have another big note because, like I mentioned, I tend to forget things. So the bigger the note, I had to put some lines underneath it, exclamation points after the last word to make sure Jay got that part covered. But nowhere on that I've looked at this thing over and over and over again. Nowhere on here does it say, Jay, take a left turn, a sharp left turn, an unexpected left turn, and talk about early 2000s NBA basketball. Not on there, but I loved it. It was a great way to capitalize and end a fun conversation that Corey and I had. Yes, it was all about Ohio State athletics, basketball, and football. Two things that him and I, uh, I'm I'm, I'm focusing more on Ohio State basketball now than I used to. Always focus on the football program. Corey focuses on those all the time, which is why he's a great, he's great about that. He's great to bring on for these kind of conversations. But even better, hey man, impromptu. What, take a take a sharp left turn. You never know what's going to happen. And sometimes those sharp left turns we take, we're on a road trip. We take a turn. Uh, that's not. That's just there. It's like, hey, uh, this this looks good. Let's go this way. You never know what's, what you're going to find. And that conversation at the end is very similar to those road trips we take. And we take an unexpected turn. We don't know what's going to happen. Sometimes those are the best adventures. Just like this fun conversation, this great capitalization at the end of this conversation that Corey and I had. Thank you for listening to another episode of the J. Stevens Podcast. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at jstevens07. If you're not on Twitter and you would like to connect with the podcast, send your emails to jstevenspod at gmo.com. Remember to always subscribe, rate, and review. It's a great way for people that are searching for new podcasts to listen to to come across this one. Then remember to always get the word out about the podcast via word of mouth, the things that we enjoy in life. We are more willing and somewhat wired to tell other people about. So no matter if this was your first episode or if you have been listening to episode one, be sure to people know about the podcast. This has been episode 84 of the J.C. Podcast. I'll see you next time. <laughs>